Boy, it got quiet in here. As long as everybody's quiet, let's go ahead and start. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the house of the Lord this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Amen. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. We've got a few announcements this morning. It is beginning of a week of prayer for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We'll see a video about that in just a few moments. Also, uh, there is a prayer portal on our website. You can go to our church's website, submit a prayer request there if you need to do that. And then, of course, tonight uh, here in the sanctuary, we will be worshiping together at 6 o'clock. And then the Journey Kids will meet uh, back in the back. Everybody's preparing for next Sunday night for the... Uh, Christmas cantata and so be in prayer for all of that that's next Sunday night at six o'clock and uh, afterward we're going to have snack food uh, Christmas type snack food and finger food if you bring it (laughs) so those of us who like to eat say please bring it right amen next Sunday night after cantata we are having fellowship and so we want you to bring uh, snacks and finger food Uh, back to Fellowship Hall, and we will enjoy a time of fellowship together as church body. And then, of course, tomorrow night, Celebrate Recovery uh, begins at 5 o'clock, large group uh, for the meal, and then large group starts at 5.30. Uh, There's a number and a name there in the bulletin. If you need information about Celebrate Recovery, be glad to answer your questions. And then the men's prayer breakfast at 7 o'clock down at Bentley's Restaurant. Again, guys, if you come for the first time, we'll buy your breakfast. Uh, somebody asked me not long ago, how long does that usually last? If you needed to leave and, and get to work or wherever, you could be gone by 7.30 if you need to most, uh, most Tuesday morning. So uh, it's quick and it's easy and it's fairly painless. So we have a good time, the ones who come. So hope you'll come, guys, to that. Joy of Living still taking their winter break, resume after the new year. And uh, Wednesday night, we'll be doing our normal thing here uh, with Awana and with the youth group. 
And then Thursday night, and you'll see a little more information about this uh, in just a few moments, uh, but we want you to come Thursday night. I know some of you will be leaving, going out of town. Uh, there's a group of, of, from our church that's going to leave and go to another church uh, for a, a dinner and a, and a and theater. But uh, Caleb Freeman is going to be here that night, and you'll, you'll see more about him. I'll talk more about him in just a few moments. Uh, but again, that's Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Uh, the school uh, called First Priority, it's the campus, uh, it's the Christian club on campus, that's how I need to say that, uh, is, is uh, sponsoring that, and we are just hosting that as a church. It is for teenagers, but it's also for you. I'm telling you, you will be blessed if you come, and you'll see a short video in a little while about that. And then, of course, uh, Saturday night, of this next week, December the 10th, at 6 o'clock, is the uh, ladies' event. And then the Christmas cantata next Sunday night. A lot of stuff going on this week. It all happens this week around Westside. And then we take a deep breath until after the New Year. So uh, come to all those events that you can come to. And I think Miss Linda has an announcement that she needs to make. So come, Miss Linda. Okay, uh, because we're emphasizing the youth first priority this week, we have set up uh, several things to help pray for that service. First of all, this morning, if you were in Sunday school, I hope you received a prayer booklet to with prayer requests for that event. We ask that you please be in prayer for them each day between now and Thursday. And also, we're trying something new. How many of you have ever been in an interactive prayer room? Now, I know those of you that went to Israel were in the Jerusalem prayer room, so I know you have. The, the idea is that you not just read a prayer request or say a prayer silently, but that you also involve your senses, your body, your whole self in the worship and prayer time. So we have set up a small interactive prayer room for this first priority event. And I would hope that each of you gets an opportunity between now and Thursday to experience that. And it is a treasure hunt to find room. But for those of you that were here three years ago or before, it is in the pastor's old office. For those of you who are newer to our church family, it, uh, there is orange tape starting in the hallway by the church office. Follow the orange tape, and it will direct you to that prayer room. Okay. I wanted yellow. You know, I wanted a yellow brick road, but I just couldn't afford the frogger tape. So it's orange. <laughs> So, but I do hope you'll take advantage of that prayer room and this opportunity to lift up our young people in prayer. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Linda, uh, for that. Thank you for doing that. I think it's going to be a blessing to you, and I think Thursday night is going to be a, a big night, uh, not just here for our church, but I think it's going to be a big night for the kids on campus. And so we are trying to get the word out, so you help us to do that. Uh, this week, invite someone to come. You know, there's two events that'll happen this week. Uh, there's more. There's three events that'll happen this week that's easy to get people to come to. If you're a lady, it's easy to get ladies to come to a ladies' event, a meal. Uh, it's easy to get people to come to a Christmas cantata. You don't have to listen to the preacher much. Amen. People will come. And uh, the gospel will be shared. The gospel will be shared by song, but the gospel will also be shared by me. The gospel will be shared by uh, some of the drama that goes on. The gospel will be shared by our children as well uh, that night. So the gospel will go out that night. And then Thursday night, of course, uh, it's a very easy way to get people to come. Come hear about a young man who, who really should have died, but the Lord spared his life, and he's going to tell us about it. So he encourage folks to come. You come as well, if you're a guest with us in your bulletin right there on the side, it's perforated. You can tear it off very easily and let us know that you've been here to worship with us and fill out that visitor card. And on the back side of that visitor card, there's a place for prayer. That's for everyone. If you have a prayer request, you write that down. We will pray over those requests 
uh, this very week. And I know we have one special request for sure uh, because uh, Miss Carol is having surgery tomorrow. Is that right? Tomorrow. And so we certainly want to remember Miss Carol in, in our prayers. Uh, she's been very sick for quite some time. And uh, so hopefully tomorrow things uh, are taken care of and get better. Also remember the Birkeland family uh, in your prayers. Glenn did pass away. And uh, looking like the funeral will either be Wednesday or Thursday. They meet with the funeral home this afternoon. Also remember uh, the Collister family uh, as well. Linda called and they put her husband David on hospice. And I know not everybody knows them, but a lot of you do. Uh, and so remember the Collister family in your prayers uh, through these days. You know, holiday season, it seems like there's always this. You know, it follows this type of season. And you know how hard it would be if it were in your family. And so we want to remember all of these uh, in our prayers. And so I'm going to pray for those. And then we'll have a short video. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come and to worship. And Father, you've been better to us than we deserve everyone in this room. And so, Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory for that. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus who died for our sins. And, Father, it's his name that we've come to celebrate uh, today. And so help us to do that, Lord, in spirit and in truth. But, Father, before we get to that, we want to lift up every name and every need that's been mentioned. And, Father, there's some on hearts right now. They're thinking of those names and those people we should pray for. Father, our prayer list in our church just gets longer and longer, seems like, every week. And around the holiday season, it's such a hard time to lose someone. It's such a hard time to uh, go through struggle. And so, Father, we pray that you'd be with each and every need. And, Father, we celebrate uh, those places and those areas that you are working and you have done great things. And, Father, if we gave testimony to those great things that you're doing, it would take the whole service. And so, Father, we thank you for all those good things that you're doing through our church. But, Father, we lift up those who are in need. Father, we lift up our missionaries who are overseas. Father, I pray that our uh, Lottie Moon Christmas offering this year would be better than it's ever been. Father, I pray that you would bless it for your honor and for your glory and that souls might be saved. Father, we pray for Thursday night. We pray for uh, Saturday and then Sunday night. Father, a lot of outreach that happens this week around our church. Father, we pray that you'd use it for your honor and for your glory. I pray you'd fill this place up so that they may hear the gospel. Father, again, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for this day and this moment. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And before they show the video, a couple of things. Inside of your bulletin, there is a little envelope. If you are new to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, Lottie Moon was a missionary to China. Uh, she was four foot three. There's a poster out in the, in the hallway. You can stand beside Lottie, and you can see she was about that tall. It's amazing. I think about a lady that size uh, that would, would literally shake a, a continent for Jesus. But she did. And she did some fantastic work. You can read about that. But that's, it's named after her. And this offering goes to international missions only. All of this money goes overseas. None of it stays in our church. None of it stays in this nation. It goes overseas for the proclamation of the gospel. So if you've always wanted to be a part of international missions then here is an easy way to do it. Anything you put in this envelope, and if you go online, if you give that way, you'll see that it'll drop down and it'll say Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. You can give in that way as well. But anything you put in this envelope, anything you give online through Lottie Moon goes overseas. None of it stays in this church. That's why I can talk more about that than any other thing we do because when we take an offering like this, it goes for the greater good of those overseas. And listen, I know... I know this church knows and loves missions. I know that. I know you do because of what you give and the way you serve and the way you go and the way you love folks, not just here but overseas as well. And so you love them through this Christmas offering. Uh, as far as I know, there's not a goal for the offering or anything like that, but what we want to do is give as the Lord leads us to give. And so I encourage you to do that. Pray about it. You know, Pray what God would have you to do and, and do it. Do what he's asked you to do. And if you do what he says, you do the right thing. Amen? And we'll do a video. And then right after this video, the children for Children's Church will be dismissed. And we're going to dismiss just a little bit different. We did this a few months ago, and we've gotten away from it. We're going to dismiss back in the back. And if you are here and you have a child, and this is your first Sunday to send them to Children's Church, we invite you to go back and meet the ones who will be with them in Children's Church. Maybe walk back and see where they are. 
Uh, we want to be sure we know anything about food allergies or anything like that. And so you, you help us out with that. Y'all go ahead and show the video, guys. We don't see points on a map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard-to-reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief, and we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. Local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. around you can see we're about ready for Christmas here we're not really not not so much getting into Christmas not so much getting into Christmas songs today but we are uh, sort of getting into uh, these Advent songs today as we call them uh, we're very very fortunate to live in the time and area in which we do in which we have uh, have the scriptures before us and have seen that Christ has come and has done what he has done for most of uh, of, of mankind's history uh, we waited on that to happen. Mankind was looking forward to its redemption rather than looking back at its redeemer. And so we had, we had, uh, you know, for for a long time, look uh, uh, where where mankind was crying out to God. And these songs, in particular, looking at the nation of Israel as God began to reveal just a little bit more. He would sneak a little bit more through the prophets. Here's what he's going to look like. Here's what he's going to be like. Here's the kind of Messiah that you are looking for. Uh, uh, for the most part, everybody missed all those hints, but they were there nonetheless, and they're there for us to look at today and, uh, and to rejoice that the Messiah has come. But, uh, but today we're going to sing these songs about Advent uh, sort of from that perspective as crying out and yet looking back now, realizing that our Messiah has in fact come. Let's stand together today as we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Come 
familiar with, but what a beautiful message in it. Come thou long expected Jesus. Come thou long expected Jesus born to set thy people free from our fears and sin Oh. Uh-huh. 
pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, as the message of the song declares, Lord, that you were born by people to deliver. Heavenly Father, we know that without Christ we have no hope, and yet we praise you, Father, so much that, that you sent the hope of the world into the world, Father. Lord, not just simply to, to live the perfect life, Lord, and show us how to do it on our own, Father, but also to show, to show to us that we cannot do it on our own. And, Father, we thank you, Lord, that he did the work, Lord, built that bridge between us and you, Father, so that we could know you and have relationship with you. Father, I pray specifically today if there's anybody in this room that does not have that relationship with you, that today would be the start of it. We pray, Lord, that you would draw us to you in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, what, what's, what have the last several years been like for you? Uh, it's been amazing. I feel like it's just shown me what the true heart of God is, like how much it cares, because I had something odd stacked against me. I can't help you never walk, talk, or eat again. But whenever you're being told those things, you feel pretty hopeless. But then you notice after thousands of prayers get lived up to Jesus, like you start seeing all those miracles performed. Like now I can tell you as a 21 year old who's eating, walking and talking again, I can tell you it doesn't matter what people say in your lives because God will always have the final say. Amen. That young man that you saw on that video, that's Caleb. That's the one who'll be with us Thursday night. And uh, Caleb was in a horrible uh, car accident, vehicle accident. And when they found Caleb, uh, there was the semi that had hit him, his head was crushed up against the grill of that semi truck. And, and there's no way you live from that, uh, as they say, but God. God brought them through. In that testimony as well, his dad, who is a pastor, First Baptist Newcastle, Oklahoma, uh, his dad and, and Ma and, and his mother had lost his brother to cancer just a few years before that. And so they have been through death, they have been through hard times, they have been through struggle, and he, Caleb, and his dad, Jeremy, will be here Thursday night to share that testimony and to share the great hope that is in Jesus Christ. Listen, I promise you, it's not a downer of a night. It's a very great encouragement to you and to I keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And it's a tough time of year to add something to an already very busy schedule for most of us. But I'm telling you, you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. And who can't give up an hour or so of their Thursday night? I mean, what else are you going to do that's so important on Thursday night that you can't come? So unless you're going to the dinner theater with the church, be here. Amen. Come, I'm telling you, you will be blessed. We are going to take up a love offering that night to help pay for some of their expenses. But everything will go to them uh, that night as well. But we want you to come. Also, afterwards, after everything is over, we're going to serve the students back in the back. Uh, pizza, I think, is what we're, what we're doing for the kids. If you want to help serve, you, you feel free to come back and help serve those students uh, Thursday night. It's a great time of outreach as a church body. And thank goodness we have a Christian club on campus that's trying to reach out. Amen? And so we're praying for that night. I hope you are as well. This is not just for Westside students. We've got students that go to Quitman. We've got students at homeschool. We've got students that go other places as well that are connected with our church. We want you all to come. We want you to bring someone uh, from your school and come. And if you're homeschooled, bring your parents. Let's all stand. <laughs> Let's all stand. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter Acts chapter 18, I know uh, we're saying a lot about Christmas and, and, and the coming wonderful season that we are in as we celebrate not the birth of a baby, but the birth of a Savior, amen? That's what we celebrate. We don't celebrate that baby, we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ, but that's how he came, was in the form of that little baby, and so we celebrate that this Christmas season. But we're going to look today in Acts chapter 18 and what it looks like to be a builder, a grower of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look there with me, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, and having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, 
he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word and for the truth of it. Father, I pray today, Lord, that we'd see what it means to be a worker, a builder, a grower of your kingdom through the tool that you use, the church. Father, I pray that you'd help us to see the truth that's in this passage for our lives today. And Father, more than that, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, I pray today would be their day. Father, I also pray for those who know you that are away from you. Father, I pray they'd come home. And Father, for those who need to follow in baptism and church membership, Father, I pray they'd come to Westside today. You speak. Help us to listen, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a man. He was shoveling snow from his driveway. Two boys came along. They were carrying snow shovels, and they approached him. And here's what they said. They said uh, that they wanted to shovel the snow for the man and said, it's only $2 for us to shovel your snow. The man looked at them very puzzling, and he said, can't you see that I'm doing it myself? Sure, said the two boys. That's why we ask. So we get most of our business from people who are about halfway through and feel like quitting. <laughs> There's a professor who used to say to his students at Wheaton College that it's always too soon to quit. Charles Spurgeon used to remind his London congregation that by perseverance, the snail Reach the ark. <laughs> How true that may be, right? It's easy to quit. It's easy to quit. And a couple of years ago, you had a great excuse. COVID. COVID. I'm going to tell you, COVID taught the church a lot about the church, didn't it? You know, it's just tough. It's a hard season of life to go through. And I'm going to tell you, some churches didn't survive it. Some churches had to shut their doors because of it. And, you know, God pruned away in church life. And it's so sad, isn't it? So sad to see that happen to churches. I mean, good gospel preaching churches. Now, if they're not preaching the gospel, they ought to shut their doors, right? But gospel preaching churches that just had to stop. Preachers without a place to preach the gospel because people just... Well, they just quit. They just quit. Now, we're blessed at Westside. We didn't have a lot of that, and we didn't see a lot of people fall away at Westside because of COVID. Now, we, we had some that, that kind of trickled back in. They were a little nervous about it, and that's fine, perfectly fine, but I'm glad to see that the majority of them are back. I don't know that we have uh, many, if any, that just watch online now because of actually COVID, but if we do have someone who's watching online who's kind of uh, a little far back from coming to church, I'm going to encourage them today to come and fellowship with us. Amen? Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, watching online is good when you need it. It's good when you need it. And we're grateful for it. And we're going to keep doing it. Amen? I think it's great when we need it. And some of you, I know you were away for Thanksgiving and other things, and you either watch that Sunday morning or you watch later in the week because some of you told me. And you told me what I preached on, so I know you watched and I'm grateful to have that avenue of outreach and that avenue for our church members when we need it. But I'm going to tell you, being at home and watching online is like turning on. I've got a Roku on my television. Some of you do too. And you can find that there is a, uh, uh, an app or whatever you call that. I don't know what you call that. But you can turn on a fire on that TV. And it doesn't matter how close you get to it, you can't get warm. And watching online is like that. It, it is. It'll help. It'll make you feel warmer. But you can't feel the warmth of other believers. And I'm telling you, the Bible tells us to meet. The Bible tells us to gather. And the Bible says that as you see the day approaching, that we ought to gather more. And we're taking uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 seriously this week. Because we're going to meet lots this week. But we need to be together. We need to be in community. Just last night, just last night, my, my brother-in-law had, had a baby. Now, when I say my brother-in-law had a baby, 
we're not going to make a lot of money. His wife had a baby, right? I said that in my Sunday school class. They said, wow, a miracle happened. I said, no, nah, it wasn't that. It, a miracle did happen. There's a birth of a child, and everybody's healthy. But and so we're down at the hospital, and I'm sitting there in that waiting room. Y'all, I, I didn't get to bed till about 1 o'clock this morning. Oh, I know you feel sad and sorry for me. If I fall asleep while preaching, y'all just leave quietly, you know? <laughs> We're down there in the waiting room, and I'm scrolling through Facebook, killing time, and there is a, a lady on Facebook. Now, this is not just a, a member of a church. I've been to Africa with this lady. She is a servant. And I saw where she had posted that ways to, to ruin a church, to kill a church, or to hurt a church, whatever, whatever it was. And all of those were legitimate ways that church people hurt churches. I, I agree. We're good at it. Wouldn't you agree with that? Amen. And, and, and there was a comment after that, and the comment said this, I had to leave the church for these very reasons. And the comment right after that, she makes the statement, we just left the church for these reasons as well. And when you say leaving the church, here's what I think that was meant by her comment anyway, that we left that church <laughs> and went to another church. I hoped but I looked at that, and I don't normally join in in any type of controversy and stuff on Facebook. I'm going to tell you, you don't win on Facebook. You may win in person, but you don't ever win on Facebook. But when I see things like that with people that I know that need to have themselves in church, and I just made a little comment. I said, oh, I agree with everything you said. Church folks can kill churches. Church folks can hurt churches. I know that. Nobody gets hurt more than the preacher. I promise you. I don't care how bad the church has hurt you. It's hurt me worse. I promise you that. But don't leave the church. You may leave that church, but you need the community of believers in Jesus Christ called the church. That's how God set this thing up. I was in a Chevrolet dealership back in the back with a guy who ran the service desk. And here's what he said. Here's how you know it's going to be a good conversation. He said, you're the pastor of that church down there, aren't you? Just like that. You know, he's real excited about who I am, right? I said, yeah, I am. You know? And here's what he said. He said, I believe you can be a Christian, but you don't have to go to church. I said, well, yeah. I mean, it's possible. It is. But I'll tell you this. You can't be a contented Christian and not be in church. And he looked at me real weird, and I thought, well, you're not saved. You have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm going to tell you, there is nothing like not having a church body to attend as a Christian. Man, it's like not having a family to go to at Christmas. It's awful. It's, it's tough. It's, it's hard. It's... And I've been there where you just want to throw your hands up in the air and say, to heck with it all, we're all nuts and we'll never do anything good. And that's a true statement. But then you've got Jesus. And when he steps into a life and makes a radical change, and hey, y'all, I've got really radical news for a Sunday morning in the month of December. Not everybody who goes to church and claims Christ as, as, as Savior is actually born again. Did you know that? The Bible says, the book of James says, that the devil himself believes and trembles at the name of Jesus. It's not naming the name of Jesus that sets us apart and sets us aside. I, I used this illustration not long ago in one of my messages, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, I have no idea when. But I used this illustration. I had a pastor one time because it says in the book of, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians, it may be 2 Corinthians, that makes the statement that without the Holy Spirit in a person's life, you can't say Jesus is Lord. And because of that, I had a pastor one time when I, when I was struggling with my own salvation. I said, am I really saved? Am I really born again? He said, can you say Jesus is Lord? I said, yeah. He said, well, say it. I said, Jesus is Lord. He said, the Bible says you're saved. Hogwash. I can say the earth is flat, but that doesn't make this rascal flat. You can say anything. The proof is not in what you say. The proof is in how you live. You say, well, I don't have to prove anything to you. And you are correct. But you do to a holy God. And I'm going to tell you, I have no idea if there's anybody in this room who's thinking about quitting. 
I have no idea. Nobody's told me. I'm thinking about quitting, Brother Doug. I'm praying about leaving the church as a whole. I, I've never, I've not heard that. But I'm telling you, there's somebody in here thinking about quitting. There's somebody in this room that is saying, you know what? I'm about sick of even trying. Why do we even try? We just beat our head up against the wall, and all we face is friction. And listen, the only persecution I've ever had came from inside the church. I've never been persecuted from outside the church. I've lived in the Bible Belt all my life. Life. I've never lived anywhere else. In the Bible Belt, lost people don't come and fight the church. The church fights the church in the Bible Belt. We argue and we fuss and we fight and we gripe. And why don't we do it that way? We've never done it that way before. If I, I wish I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Sometimes you want to say, well, praise God. <laughs> We tried something new because what we've been doing is not a working. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you're thinking about quitting the church, you may quit this one. Don't quit the church. Amen. You may go to another church. I, I hope nobody's praying about that. But if you are, we're going to miss you. But go get in a church. Don't say no to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a glorious thing. Amen. It's the bride of Christ. It, it, it's the one whom he died for. It's the one that the Bible says he is clothed in white garments. It's the group of people who are believers in Jesus Christ. Not just saved, but believers, followers, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ who are yearning to grow deeper in him and in his word and who have this deep desire whether they express it outwardly or not in a good way who knows but they have this inward desire to see lost people come to jesus they may not know how they may not be equipped they may be too caught in picking lazy to do it we've seen that before right but they have something inside of them that keeps moving them says you need to do this this is who you are you are no longer who you used to be. You have been made new. Priscilla and Aquila are those people. Man, if you read about people in your Bible that are builders of the kingdom, builders of the church, these two almost unnamed people, we see them named, but we don't hear a lot about Priscilla and Aquila. But I'm telling you, they're everywhere. They are movers and shakers in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not up here, not on the platform, but they are workers. How are you a builder of the church and not a crumbler of the church? Well, people who build the church work together. They work together. The Bible says that after these things, after Mars Hill, the Apostle Paul leaves. He leaves Athens. He goes to Corinth. Man, when he goes to Corinth, you talk about a pagan society. If you read the history of Corinth, when Paul came in that day, the most pagan society, in my opinion, that possibly has ever existed was in Corinth. It was awful. It was awful. The things they would do uh, in their so-called worship to their so-called love goddess, and you can just go from there, right? Let your mind go crazy. That's what they did. That's what they did. And they would sacrifice their own children, not to death, but to sexual immorality for the glory of their great so-called God. There were prostitutes at the temple, both male and female. It was awful. It was horrible what was going on in the city of Corinth when Paul comes to town. The city of Corinth is about 200,000 people, so we're talking about a pretty good-sized city, especially in the Apostle Paul's day. When Paul comes to town, it's horrible, horrible. And you say, well, why would Paul even worry with a place? Because it was horrible, and they needed Jesus. Amen. Man, when the, the darkness is the darkest, the light shines brightest. I'm telling you, Paul comes to town, and he can't stand what he sees. He knows there is a need for kingdom work. The Bible says that when he gets there, he finds a Jew named Aquila. He's a native of Pontus, having uh, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews leave Rome, and so he came to them. Now listen, they're not in Corinth because Claudius decided that all the Jews need to leave Rome. 
They are in Corinth because God knew that the Apostle Paul would need someone to help him in the work in Corinth. And so God put it upon the heart of Claudius to make all the Jews leave Rome. So that Priscilla and Aquila, they never would have went to Corinth. They never would have been caught dead in Corinth. You talk about a pagan society. Why would they go there? Unless God moved the heart of the emperor who moved them to Corinth. You think when they left Rome, they thought this is a good place to be? You think when they left, they thought, oh, man, we get to leave our hometown. This is awesome. No. No. They thought what you would think. It's the end of the world. My life's been turned upside down. God, why me? Why would you do this to me? Why would you allow this to happen in my life? You ever been there? Maybe, just maybe, it happened, whatever happened, for the glory of God. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he takes all things in the life of a believer, and all things, look it up in the Greek, it's P-A-S. It means all, the whole, or the entire sum. So guess what all means? It means all. <laughs> all things for good. For those who love him, and are called according to his purpose. All means all. You say, Brother Doug, how can he use cancer? Don't know, but he does. Brother Doug, how can he use the loss of a child to cancer? I don't know, come Thursday night. Come Thursday night and you'll hear the testimony of one who will tell you that God has used that tragedy for his glory. How can he use a car wreck? Come Thursday night, you'll, you'll hear. You'll hear. You'll hear how God has radically changed the life of Caleb, who was a very timid man, but you'll see that he is not a timid young man anymore for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will put you where he needs you so that he can use you for his purpose. And y'all, that's all we're called to do. Be used for the purpose of the kingdom of God. Be used for the purpose where you are, where you are, where you are, when you are. There's never been a greater time for you to be where you are than right now. God knows what he's doing. I say God knows what he's doing. It's a good place for an amen. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's up to. You say, my whole life's falling apart. Quill and Priscilla's life fell apart too. They had to leave where they, their, their home. They had to leave everything they knew. They went to Corinth. They were forced to. Aren't you glad nobody's going to force you to leave your home? Yet that you know of it could be us next week we have no idea we run around and talk about the freedom that we have the freedom that we have is given by a holy god and the holy god that gave us the freedom can take it away and if he does it'll be for his glory and to god be the glory great things he has done you say brother doug you you saying you won't lose all your freedom heck no i don't want to lose it any more than you do but if God removes it, it will be for his glory. You, you know who we're reading about, right? Paul. You remember what Paul did? Paul went to Rome. We just read all the Jews are supposed to leave Rome. Paul's making his way to Rome. Why is he making his way to Rome? Because in his heart, he believed he was supposed to go to Rome. And we'll talk before we finish the book of Acts about whether he's supposed to go to Rome or, or, or not. We will talk about that before we get done. But in his heart, he believed, I'm supposed to go to Rome. I want to go to Rome. And so what does he do when he gets to Rome? He lives a life of bondage, ultimately, that leads to his death. Why? For the glory of God. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila are here for the glory of God. What were they about? They were about the Great Commission. Everywhere they went, they were about the Great Commission. What's the Great Commission? Matthew chapter 28 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you ever wondered why we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, it's right there. It's in, it's in red if you have a red letter Bible. Jesus said that that's the way we ought to baptize. And you teach them to observe everything that he has commanded us. And remember that he is with us to the end of the world, to the end of the earth age, to the end of eternity. Is there an end to eternity? 
no. He's with us always. And as we go, we share the gospel. Priscilla and Aquila, also known as Prisca and Aquila, in Romans chapter 16, the Bible says this in verses 3 and 4, greet Prisca and Aquila. And this is what Paul says to them. Fellow workers in Christ Jesus who for my life, listen, risk their own necks to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. The Apostle Paul says they risk everything for me. We're going to read where they do that very thing, where they follow the Apostle Paul's leadership in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 18, even when they didn't want to. Even when that wasn't their desire, they did it for the kingdom good and for the church's good so that God would be honored and God would be glorified. The Apostle Paul says in Romans that they risked their own necks for me so that the gospel might go out. When's the last time you risked your neck for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? When's the last time you put your whole life on the line for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, Brother Doug, nobody's trying to take the life of of a Christian in America, well, they may not be trying to take your life. But God may be very well putting you into a place where you may lose your friends, you may lose your family, you may lose everything you have for standing for the truth that is truth. I had a guy tell me one time, he had told me about a situation, and he said, I know that's not how you would handle that. I said, you're exactly right. I would never have done that. I would never have said that. And here's what he said. This is a direct quote. He said, well, you and me, Brother Doug, we're just cut from a different cloth. That's what he said. I don't know exactly what that means. But I think it means that he would compromise but Brother Doug would not compromise. And to that, I said, you're right. And that ended the conversation. You want to know something real scary? He's a member of my church. You start that sink in for a second. You talk about encouraging you as a pastor. And you say, Brother Doug, was that at that, that one church you talk about? You always talk about that one church. And the answer to that is no. It was not. Compromise. Stopping. Quitting. All those are words that are not in my vocabulary. You know why? You say, well, that's the way you were raised. It It was. It really was. But you know why I was raised that way? Because it's biblical. You say, Doug, but the Democrats. I never found that word in my Bible. (laughs) You say, Doug, but the Republicans. Not there. Not there. Listen, they were under Roman oppression. We don't like some things that happen in government on both sides. Nothing wrong with that. We ought to vote and we ought to pray and we ought to do all that. But I'm telling you, if you're letting politics and stuff around you, this world dictate how you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, well, you've missed the boat. If you're letting the way other church members speak to you and talk to you and even treat you at times uh, dictate how you love Jesus, you're missing, you missed it. You, you, you missed the point of it all. Now, now listen, I, I love the church. I, I love church people. I mean, most of them. <laughs> no, I love all of them. I just don't like some of them. Can I get a witness in the room? Amen. I'm telling you, church folks be some of the meanest folks you ever have laid your eyes on. We can say some of the dumbest things to each other and about lost people. We can judge them, and we can talk about them. That was the first question in my Sunday school lesson this morning. It, you know, how do we put ourselves in someone else's shoes and understand their life and where they are? And somebody in the room, and I, I, I may get this wrong, uh, the quote, but it was something to the effect that if you really knew them, you could love them. If you really knew where they were as a human, you could love them. You might not like where they are. You might not agree with it. But you could love them in Jesus' name if you really knew their background and who they were. Listen, church. We, as a church body, are a lot like cows in a pasture. Do you know why they take a cow that has been hurt? They take them out of the herd and feed them in the feedlot or feed them in the barn. Do you know why they do that? Because if they don't, that cow will never get food. 
that cow will suffer and that cow will die, not get healed. You would think that other cows would come along that hurt cow and put their little hooves around them or whatever they would do <laughs> and help them along, you know. There's a whole herd out here. There's plenty of food for everyone. No, they don't. They will butt and kick and stomp at them and keep them away from the food because cows are selfish. All they're about is themselves. They're not about others. And so the farmer has to take the cow away from the herd. Doesn't the cow die? The other cows, if they don't uh, keep it from eating enough, they'll stomp it to death. Because that's nature, right? That's the law of nature. Let the weak be weak and the strong eat and all that other stuff. Sad thing is, in the church, we're a lot like that. Somebody gets hurt, somebody gets down, somebody gets out of God's will, we'll beat them to death. We'll butt and we'll kick and we'll go to lunch and we'll talk about them, usually behind their back, but sometimes to their face, and we will shun them. We will have nothing to do with them. We are done with you because you have, and listen, you've done the same thing just in a different way. That's where Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. Be careful when you start getting hypocritical about church life. Man, this is the body of Christ called Westside First Baptist Church. And I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Are we perfect? No. no. You know why? Because nine years ago you called me to be the pastor. <laughs> did, you, did you realize this is the anniversary of me coming to this church? It's the first Sunday of December. And listen... When you called me, if you were perfect before I came, you all of a sudden became imperfect. But now I know you. You weren't perfect before I came. <laughs> and you're not perfect now, and that's okay. Because Jesus died for the imperfect. Amen. You're in a good place when you realize how imperfect you are. Aquila and Priscilla come. Paul joins them, and they begin the church that you know as the church at Corinth. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Psalm 133 and verse 1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing when brothers and sisters in Christ can dwell and live and work together. If you want to be a church that builds up the kingdom, you've got to work together. The Bible says that in verse 5, uh, well, let's talk about this real quick. Verse 3, he says that he stayed with them, that they were of the same trade, they were tent makers. Now, when you think of a tent, uh, you may not be thinking the same thing they did. Tent maker, leather worker would go hand in hand. So the Apostle Paul was not a person who built the tents with the, the little pegs that nobody has time to put up and you don't read the directions and it's hard to pop that sucker up you know it wasn't that kind of tent he was a leather worker and so when he comes to town the way he gets to know Priscilla and Aquila is they just happen to be leather workers as well the problem is in the kingdom of God nothing just so happens to be that way right God put this together you see how he is building and putting together a puzzle of the church the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Acts in an intricate way where this person has to get with this person so that the kingdom of heaven can be built and he did the same thing at Westside he put people here people by name in this place some of you have told me you, you, you didn't take a, a, a dart and just hit them out but you literally could have moved anywhere on the planet and you chose to move here. And some of you have told me, many of you, as a matter of fact, that you didn't know why you moved here. It's a beautiful place, but you didn't know why you moved here until you came to this church. And you knew exactly why God had brought you to Greer's Ferry. Praise God for that. Praise the Lord for that. You know what that means? That means you have a job at Westside. You say, no, I don't have a job yet. Oh, yeah, you do. You're not working it yet. God knows what you need to do here at Westside. God knows where you're needed in this church. Wouldn't have brought you here if he didn't know where you needed. And you say, well, I don't know. We'll figure it out. You say, how do you figure it out? It's an open book. Man, 
Read it. Look at the church. Come talk to the pastor. I know him. And say, hey, I'm trying to find a place to get plugged in. I I can tell you 10, 12 things that need to be done. We'll find you a place. You say, Brother Doug, well, if I do the wrong thing, we'll stop and we'll do something different. (laughs) You know what happens when this church makes a mistake? We do it a lot. We don't do that anymore. (laughs) We do something different. I'll pivot on a dime. I tell you, I, I've done so many dumb things in the last nine years that people have looked over and rolled their eyes at and said, I can't believe he's doing that. And then I do it and go, I can't believe I did that. And we need to do something different. But I tell you what we're not going to do. Nothing. Well, I'm going to sit around and do nothing. It's not what God's called us to do. Find your place and get to work. The Bible says that the Apostle Paul had to make a living, so he was a tent maker, right? He was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath. That's what he does in every town he goes to. He's trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. Now, in other places, you see that he's trying to persuade the Jews. But here, you hear those words, and the Greeks. He's moving to the Gentiles. He's getting away from the Jews. As a matter of fact, you're going to hear him say it here in just a few moments. And so he's moved to the synagogue. He's trying to reason with them. He's trying to persuade them. And the Bible says, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. Now listen, that's important. There are some in church life that will say that it's wrong to be full-time in the ministry. In other words, not to have another job outside of the ministry other than the ministry, that you need to have a job outside. And I'm not against those who do that. As a matter of fact, you should pray for those people who are what we call bivocational because what they are is full-time in the church and then still trying to support themselves outside of the church. And there are many out there like that, and we need to pray for them. Dimitri, uh, the young man that we're uh, partnering with down in El Dorado, he's doing that. He has another job and also is trying to plant a church. I can't imagine how hard that must be. And some will say, well, the Apostle Paul was a tent maker. He was. He was. The Bible says that he was a tent maker, and and, and he was reasoning in the synagogue, and he was doing leather work all at the same time, back and forth, until uh, Silas comes, until Timothy comes. And when they came, he began to devote himself to the synagogue full-time, full-time ministry. Why? They would go work. And share what they had with the Apostle Paul. That's what you do. That's what you do. You know how I get paid. It's through your gifts. Now, we don't take everything you give and give to me. And if the church votes to do that, we're not going to do that. There's kingdom work that has to be done. We're not going to take everything that this church has... And give it to me and Roger and and Paul. We're not going to do that. We're going to give to the kingdom. And we're going to keep what we bring in. And what we give out. And what we keep here. We're going to keep those percentages where they need to be. And it needs to be no more than 50% to staff. But when we get to a point where... We're 40, 45 percent somewhere in there are lower, then what that means is we're understaffed. And you know that's about where we are now. Did you know that? Now, I don't know what that means for the future. It kind of scares me a little bit to even think about it. But that's kind of where we are right now. That means our church has grown to a place that it's hard for the ones you have now to keep up with it all. And I'm going to tell you, the ones you have now will say amen to that. They won't now, but I'll do it for them. It's difficult to keep up. And we see need, but we can't feel it. And so there may be in the future a need for more staff. I have no idea. I have no idea. And I don't even want to think about having to go and find someone and all that stuff. I have no idea what God has for the future of this church. But I'll tell you this. It's biblical. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a person being full-time in the ministry if they work it right. And if they're lazy, then they don't need to be at any job, right? And, and, and I understand that. And, and if you've been around church life long, you've seen that where people don't work their, their work. 
But if you've been in any other job, you've seen that there too, right? The Apostle Paul stopped working. He stopped leather making, and he devoted himself full time to the word and to the ministry when he had someone who could help him financially. And that's the way church life works. So if you hear that argument about Paul, well, he was a tent maker and all pastors ought to work outside the church. Well, the problem with that is Paul wasn't always a tent maker. He did it when he needed to. At any church that I go to, and the ones who were on that search committee when I came here nine years ago can attest to this. I don't talk about finances until the end, but I do talk about finances. And here's how I talk about finances. I have no idea what you're going to pay. I've already made my decision whether I'm coming or not in my heart at that point. But I need to know what you pay, because if you don't pay enough for me to support my family, then I just need to know I need to get a job when I get there and still do the ministry. That's how I respond. I'm not afraid to go work. I'm not afraid to dig a ditch. I'm not afraid to chip rock or whatever else I need to do. I'm not afraid of that. And so that's how a good response, in my opinion, needs to be. Not that I won't go because you don't pay enough. I've heard that before, and maybe some of you have as well. I don't know. I heard of a church not long ago. The pastor told them that, said, you don't pay enough. They got back together, and they voted to give a $12,000 a year raise uh, to him to get him to come to their church. And one of their uh, search committee members asked me what I thought of that. I said, I don't think he'll last long. Because I would never do that just to get a man to come. That's just me. And that's just things I don't compromise on in my own personal life. I don't think any preacher should. Because if you work, then I ought to be willing to work. Amen? I'm just sharing my heart. All right? But Paul, when he had the funds, he devoted himself to the word and to the work. But he runs into a problem. He always does, doesn't he? The Bible says in verse 6 that when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments. And here's what he said. Your blood be on your own heads. I'm clean. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. From that point, from that statement on, you never see him again specifically looking for the Jews. Not that he wouldn't witness to a Jew. Not that he wouldn't share the good news with the Jews, but you never see. You see a shift right there in that verse. When Paul makes a statement, brother, he means it. He's not playing games. He says, I'm tired of beating my head up against the wall for you Jews. You don't want it? I'll go to the Gentiles. And that's how God gets him to be what we know as the apostle, the preacher to the Gentiles. And when he left there, he went to the house of a man named Titus Justus a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they had heard, uh, were believing and being baptized. So many are getting saved. Many are getting baptized. The Lord says to Paul in the night by vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people... In this city. As you've read, as we've gone through the book of Acts, you've been here every Sunday morning, you know this. Paul doesn't shrink from anything. Paul goes, man, he'll look them right in the eye. You're going to see him later, goes, goes to kings and goes to leaders. He's not afraid of, of, of anybody. I mean, I've made the statement from this pulpit that the Apostle Paul is my kind of guy. Man, he doesn't run from a fight, he's not afraid. He's been beaten. He's been left for dead. I believe he did die in Lystra, and God brought him back from the dead. He's been through it. As a matter of fact, he would later write to the Philippian church and say, you've got hard times. You think you've been through hardship? He said, look at my back. I bear the marks and the scars of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been through it. And here we see Jesus tell him, do not be afraid any longer. You say, what, what's that about? Paul's not afraid? He's not concerned for his own life? Yes, he was. You just didn't know it. 
but Jesus does. Jesus knows. Isn't that odd as you read through the book of Acts? Don't be afraid. You see words in red. All of a sudden, just boom, come up out of nowhere. And you think, what is this about? Jesus knows his heart. And he knows he's struggling. Man, I'm going to tell you, I've had people make statements, Brother Doug, you're just so bold. If you were in my prayer closet, you might not think so. If you, if you really knew my heart about something, I think, man, this, this, could, this could be it. When we built this building, it was a great illustration of this could be it. I remember. Man, that was tough. I've been recounting some of those days this past week about what God did through that time. And we prayed about it so much, and we talked about it so much, and then we had to present it to the church. Some of y'all remember that night. You couldn't see me because the pulpit that I stood behind that night wasn't open like that one was. So my knees were knocking. And God was doing a great thing in our church. He was growing us. That old sanctuary was jam-packed. Y'all remember that? And I thought, I don't want to mess this up. But you see, two churches before this, when I was in a church, we started doing that in the middle of nowhere. You think Greer's Ferry is the middle of nowhere. You ought to go to Bradley, Arkansas. Dead center of the armpit of Arkansas, right there. That'll do it. And yet, God just put his hand on that church. And we went from 53 to 63 to 153. Then we averaged 166. We were in the top 1% in the state of Arkansas for growth. Now, I didn't know that, but the executive director of a state convention at that time came down. He said, I want to buy you lunch. I said, okay, but you really need me to meet you somewhere. No, he said, I won't come to Bradley. He said, okay, well, we have two options. Uh, we can go down to the bottoms, and we can eat down there at the feed store. Or you can meet me at the gas station. We can eat there. And we met at the gas station. God was growing, and we had gotten to a point where we needed to do something. Probably didn't need to build anything, but we really needed a second service to get everybody in. And Brother Doug said, I'm not going to change anything because I don't want to mess this thing up. And we ceased to grow. As a matter of fact, we went the other direction. And so Brother Doug, in Brother Doug's mind, said, you know what, I need to make this note. When this happens again, either at this church or another church, you better do something. These gurus of church stuff, they're right. They know what they're talking about. You'll go the other direction. Fast forward several years to Greer's Ferry, Arkansas. Averaging about 130, 140, 150 on a great Sunday over in the old building, and then all of a sudden we start growing. We hit that 200 mark. And that old sanctuary, it would see 358 because I saw it done one time, but it was not comfortable, and it wouldn't happen every week because you wouldn't keep coming and sitting that way. And so we got to do something. I talked about a second service. Nobody seemed to be real excited about that. You know why they said they don't want to do that? It'll change our church, Brother Doug. It'll change our church. And so we built a building, and we changed our church. Anything you do different is going to change the church. That's the way that works. And we presented that, and we talked about it. We had two or three who were against it. Boy, they were against it. They became some of the biggest supporters of it. But that night, they were, man, they were adamant. And now here we are. Now, God did not come through Jesus and speak to my heart or speak verbally and say, don't be afraid, Doug. It's going to be okay. He did not do that. But I've been where Paul was. There's nobody new. You get up and preach with boldness, that's just the way you do it. 
You preach it because you believe it. And you act like you believe it. But then sometimes in your prayer closet you realize, I'm a sinner just like everybody else. I have my doubts. I have my moments. Everybody does. And Paul's going through one of those moments. Now, Silas didn't know. Timothy didn't know. Remember, he's leading them. You can't let them know. But Jesus does. And it's such a beautiful moment in the book of Acts when Jesus speaks that Luke can't help but write it down. You know how he knew? Paul got up, and then he went and told him. He said, I've been kind of weak, guys. I, I know it looks like I'm bold, but man, on the inside, I've been, I just been kind of thinking about not doing this anymore. I, I've been thinking, you know, the beatings and the and the stoning and the, the hardship, it just it's it's too much. I've been thinking about going back home. And I bet he had to apologize to John Mark because of this. What do you think? But guys, listen. I was alone at home. You know, Quill and Priscilla's house. And Jesus spoke. And man, let me tell you what he said. He said, don't be afraid. Don't quit. I am with you. You say, Brother Doug, I've been there, but I've never heard his voice. Well, if I'm the preacher that I need to be, he's talking right now. And you know what he's saying? Don't be afraid. Don't quit. Don't even dream of it. I am with you. But Doug, you don't know what I've been through. I don't. You, I, you don't know where I'm at. I don't. But he does. And he's with you through it all. How do you keep on keeping on? You're hand in hand with Jesus. I can't tell you how to not feel like quitting. Because I've been there. I can just tell you how to not quit. When you get to feeling that way, turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. He's not left you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And when you think all hope is gone, it's never gone with King Jesus. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, as best I know how, I've preached what you've asked me to. Lord, I'm sure I've messed up. But Lord, I pray that you use what's been said for your glory. Now, Lord, there may be someone here who's lost and need to be saved. Father, they could be today if they'd come to you. Lord, there may really be somebody here who's thinking about quitting. Maybe not quitting in those words, but they're hurting, Lord. They're going through a hard time. Seems like they're just trying and nothing's working. And, Lord, it may be that they're trying and they're out of your will. Well, I pray that you'd move them back into your will today. But, Father, it may be that they're trying and they're right in your will and you're just about to break through and do something miraculous. But, Lord, if they quit, they'll never see it. So, Lord, I pray that you'd show them today that you are with them. No reason to be afraid. No reason to turn back now and keep on keeping on. Father, thank you for people like Aquila and Priscilla. And I could put names in this room where their names are in the Bible. Lord, that they've been here. They've been in this church. They've been through good times. They've been through not so good times. We've hurt together. We've cried together. We have celebrated together. We've worked together. And Father, I thank you for that. Lord, if I start mentioning names, we'd be here all afternoon. Lord, you know their names. I pray that you bless them for their hard work. And, Father, help them to keep on keeping on. Father, I also know in this church right now, there are those that you have placed here. 
for a purpose and a plan. Father, I pray that you'd show them what you'd have them to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. Altars will be open. If you need to come, you can come. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to
guests with us today, visitors with us today. We hope you felt at home uh, here at Westside. If you're looking for a church home, uh, well, this is it. No need to look anywhere else. Come come join up with us. We'd love to have you. Uh, listen, we're so honored to have our members with us as well today. Glad to see you. And, uh, you know, I know after Thanksgiving, but, I mean, really, December, that first Sunday, starts that Christmas season. If you haven't got all your Christmas shopping done, I'm with you. All right? I'm right there with you. Don't worry about it. We'll get it done. We'll buy and spend a bunch of money for people we don't even like that much, you know? <laughs> that's, this, that's this season. Remember throughout this month that it's not about those gifts. It's about the greatest gift that's ever given, Jesus. Come back tonight. We'd love to have you. Come Thursday night. Please come Thursday night. Let's fill this place up, and let's pray for those students this week. Um, the, the, the prayer room's back there. You come any time this week that you want to pray. And uh, walk through that and give you some helps to pray for those students. I think it's a great, great thing. Uh, Brother Rogers back in the back. He's with uh, uh, the kids back there. He's excited that church is over now. <laughs> and he wants you to come get those kids, I know. Normally I call on him to pray for us, to dismiss us. But I won't do that uh, today. I'm going to ask Brother Mark. Brother Mark, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please? 